All right, did that show up as recording? Yes. Great. Hello everyone and welcome to the Master Food Preservers um, third Thursday demonstration. Uh, today we have the uh, pleasure of a presentation by Jennifer Bell on salts and infused salts with herbs and other delectables. Um, we are recording this session, so I ask that you all uh, mute yourself and um, enjoy this presentation. Uh, what I did forget to say is uh, I am the Youth Families and Communities Advisor for Humboldt and Del Norte Counties, UC Cooperative Extension. I provide academic oversight for the Master Food Preserver Program and have the pleasure of working with a wonderful group of volunteers um, who give their time for these demonstrations. So I am honored and pleased to be able to work with them. Um, before we get started, I want to do a land acknowledgement. So our organization was created on and created from land of several indigenous tribal nations. These lands were the traditional birthright of indigenous people, people who know the land and the creatures of the land and have the knowledge to sustain the land. Indigenous people have faced two centuries of struggle for survival and identity in the wake of dispossession. May we begin to address our history to recognize our responsibilities to the people of these lands and undertake significant efforts at reconciliation. Today's presenters are on the lands of the Wiat tribe. Yeah. The Wiat people have lived in Humboldt Bay region for thousands of years. Thank you. Nice. Oh, okay, I think uh, it's my turn now, right? <laughs> I think uh, people are still popping in, Dorena, and maybe you could mute them as they come in so that um, we don't hear their um, sound while they're, they're popping in. Um, so I'm Jennifer Bell, and I'm a master food preserver. I just looked down at my name badge. I was like, well, like, I should tell them when I became a master food preserver. I became one in the year 2012. So it turns out I've been a master food preserver for 10 years. Um, kind of an interesting thing is that my mother was a master food preserver in Alameda County when I was just going off to college. And I thought to myself, that is something I really want to do someday is become a master food preserver. So here I am, a master food preserver in Humboldt and Del Norte counties. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to say a couple of things about herb infused salts. Um, one thing is that you have this beautiful handout um, it's several pages that Darina has sent to each of you that you have it. And um, I really want to acknowledge Dottie Simmons. She's a master food preserver and she's the one who developed the, the information for the handout. And Tom Schrader is the person who did all the graphic design and made it beautiful and make it, made it fit our format. So the, the resource itself has a lot of hard work um, in it that people who have, you know, played with these recipes and worked on them um, to make them really easy to understand and really easy to follow. Um, so we're going to do today, there's, there's this handout and the handout is herb blends, um, season salts, herb spice blends, and infused salts. And today we're just going to oh, talk yes. about infused salts. So um, herb blends, you know, they're basically dried herbs, you put some dried rosemary and some dried basil and some dried oregano together, you mix it together and you've got an herb blend. Um, seasoned salts are the same thing with seasonings and salts, um, they're spices and salts. And then there's herb spice blends, same thing, dried herbs, dried spices, mix them all together. Sometimes you put in some, some uh, sugar, if it's like a rub or something like that. But those are all dried things that you mix together to make these blends that are really useful and really wonderful, but they're not the things that we're going to talk about today. Today I'm going to talk about infused salts, and that is when you take wet ingredients and you combine them with the salt and you make something that you then have to dry back out again. And the ingredients actually coat the salt and make them very flavorful, and there's a ton of herbs in it. I mean, a lot more herbs than there is salt. And so it is a very herbaceous um, seasoning. Uh, it's a wonderful thing. Um, and you might wonder like why make herb infused salts? Well, I guess you don't wonder because you're here today. So 
you're you're not wondering why you should do this. Um, you just want to do it. And these are some uh, a picture of some beautiful salts that I've made in the past. Some wonderful herb infused salts. Um, herb infused salts are great because when your garden is ugly, like mine is sort of coming out of ugly, it's spring right now, so it's becoming a little prettier right now and the herbs are looking a little bit better. But in the heart of winter, when everything is like, your tarragon is like, it's bare dirt, you don't even see any tarragon. And you, your, um, your herbs are like kind of black from the winter frost and they're ugly and they're rotty and they're just disgusting. And then maybe it's pouring down rain and you don't want to go out there in this awful weather to actually pick your herbs to use them in food. You can reach for your herb infused salts. So it's really nice to be able to grab these um, very simple herb infused salts. You can control the ingredients that you add to the, um, the salts. So you can go pick your beautiful organic parsley out of your garden, your beautiful organic um, oregano, your um, fantastic farmer's market basil, whatever it is, you can really can control those ingredients. One thing that I really like is it's super inexpensive. I mean, for a box of salt and the herbs out of my garden, I can make these different herb salts, I can put them in little bottles and I can give them to people um, as inexpensive gifts. I mean, it's basically right now, salt, the salt is about $7 a box. So that's four pounds of salt. So very inexpensively, you can make um, some really great herb blends. Um, they taste super delicious. They're, they're super easy to make. Um, and it's just a really fun thing to do. So um, just so you know, before I start this workshop, um, I want you to know that I washed my hands before I came here and I thought you probably didn't want to spend 20 seconds watch, watching me wash my hands. Um, and uh, so I, I, it's important to do that before you start any food preservation project because you don't want to be introducing things from your hands into the food. So um, wash my hands before we got started. Um, when is the best time to make herb infused salts? Well, I told you about the garden and the seasons and um, how, you know, it's important to not be having to go out and when your garden looks awful and you probably in the heart of winter don't want to be making herb infused salts. But what you want to do is when your herbs are just vigorous and producing like crazy. So late spring for a lot of herbs, middle of summer, fall, um, those are great times to make herb infused salts. And for me, one important ingredient that I add is my garlic from my garden. So for me, it's important that I'm picking that usually around the end of May. And so then I will start making my herb infused salts because I find I make my blends and I find that I do this thing where I go, um, this will be tarragon, oregano, rosemary, and garlic. So it's like garlic somehow ends up in every, almost every, uh, combination that I make. So I want to make sure that I have a lot of garlic, which I don't have right now. I'm completely out of garlic. I have some dried garlic. Um, so I won't be using garlic in the blend today. Um, it's important to use the best freshest ingredients you have. And I just don't have any garlic right now. It's not quite in season for me. So the next thing I want to talk about is salt. And I think a lot of people think as an ingredient, salt is salt. Salt is not salt. <laughs> So this picture that I have here is some really coarse, um, here I can show you a picture here, um, I can show you what I have in my hand, this is the container, um, I don't know if we can switch cameras there, Dorina, and maybe back out of that and go to, yeah, there we go, and um, you can see this container, it's called baleen sea salt, um, these are super heavy coarse crystals, salt is so different from from each other. Um, a teaspoon of, of table salt um, weighs uh, um, six grams. A teaspoon of Morton salt weighs 4.8 grams. And a teaspoon of diamond crystal weighs 2.8 grams. It all has to do with the type of grain of sand, of sand, the type of grain of salt and you know its density. So salt is not salt is not salt. There are also minerals that can be in salt. I'm gonna show you the next picture I think we're gonna put up is, okay, so that's diamond crystal salt. So you can see there's a big difference
between that baleen, that really big kernel salt, and this is diamond crystal. Diamond crystal is my favorite salt. And no, I don't get any uh, payment from diamond crystal company, but I have like three boxes right here because this is my favorite salt for everything. It also happens to be America's Test Kitchen's favorite salt as well. It's just a great salt. It's very um, mild tasting. It just is, adds salt. And when you start getting into some of the really fancy um, mineral salts, those minerals also carry flavors. So if you love the flavor of a certain mineral salt, like maybe it's that pink Himalayan salt, well, what makes it pink is minerals. So if you love that flavor, there's no reason why you can't make your urban few salts with that salt. I personally like the neutrality of diamond crystal. It's just a very neutral salt and it works well with everything that I do. It also works well when I'm uh, baking and things in the kitchen. So I, that is my personal favorite salt. So salt is like the main, one of the main ingredients here. Well, it's not the main ingredients. The herbs are gonna play a really big role. Um, other ingredients that I add are herbs, obviously. That's one of the things that, um, you know, is it's urban few salts. But I have some other things that I add or I have tried um, that I think have worked really well. Um, and garlic, of course, is one of them. Citrus is really good. So um, citrus is wonderful. It's, um, you know, just adds that bright lemony flavor. It's amazing. The oils in the peel of a lemon are so vivid and, and fantastic um, that it's really a wonderful uh, addition to almost any herb salt. I find that lemon appears on a lot of the labels for the salts that I make as well, garlic and lemon. I also really like to use flowers and that is really just an aesthetic thing. I don't think you can taste the flowers, but they sure are pretty in the salts. Now, if you used a chai flower, probably would add some of that um, onion-y flavor, but if you're um, using all different types of flowers, um, that it's gonna add some color to your finished salt. And I think that's really pretty and fun to use too. And sometimes you have so many flowers that you're just like, I don't wanna throw this away. I wanna use it in something. And, you know, of course it's important to make sure it's an edible flower and we'll come back to that in a little bit. Then I have the weird stuff that I've tried. I've tried a lot of weird stuff. One of the kind of weird things, somebody told me about this and of course I had to try it, is you take a bottle of wine and you reduce an entire bottle of wine to two tablespoons of wine. And then you stir that into salt. And this is what you get. That's really pretty. It's really pretty, but it has a sour flavor to it. So wow. I honestly That is really it. cool. It's really pretty, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. So that is one of the things I've played with. Now you might want to do that where you reduce an entire bottle of wine to two tablespoons and use a little bit of that and some herbs and mix it all together so that you get, so the sour flavor doesn't overpower everything. This is one I just happened to, um, to mix up. Um, other stuff that I've done that is not technically an herb is ginger. So um, sometimes you like to make blends that are um, reminiscent of certain types of cooking that you do. So you might go ginger and wasabi and, um, you know, garlic and, you know, do kind of an Asian sort of inspired twist. So um, ginger I found works well. Um, oh, macroot lime leaves, you know, I don't know if you know these, it's a, a citrus that you grow just for the leaves. They smell amazing. And um, they're really good in certain blends, but it is a very, very, very strong flavor. I can't emphasize enough. So you got to want to have that flavor, which almost has a perfumey um, hint to it. So if you're, if you find you don't like it, um, you just, you know, you might want not want to use that. So um, it's just a lot of this is personal preference. Is that a lime flavor? Uh, it's a perfumey lime flavor, a perfumey citrus flavor. It smells like perfume. Like if you had a perfume that was, had a lime incorporated into it, that's what it would, it would smell like or taste like. So um, it's a personal preference thing. I think horseradish would work, um, wasabi, like I said. 
pepper. So if you're going for a more Spanish or Mexican influenced um, salt blend, what you might do is take um, some of those really cool Mexican peppers and that are come dehydrated in the store, um, rehydrate them first because you're gonna wanna take the wet ingredient and mix it with the with other things to make sure that the, the salt is actually flavored. So that is what I would do with that, but we could come back to that in a little bit. Mushrooms, you know, people, I've seen mushroom salt in store. Um, again, if you wanted to get some color in your salt, I might take some huckleberries or some other berries um, and add those and not for the flavor so much, but some of those things are really great at dyeing things. So if you want some spectacular color to appear, that's um, what I would do. Somebody had asked along the way, where do you buy diamond crystal salt? Um, the chef store in Eureka carries it. Um, so that's where I, I buy it. Um, but some of the grocery stores too, do too. I would look in the canning sections and not so much in the fancy schmancy salt sections. So um, if you're looking for that. Somebody had asked about how do you uh, reduce wine? You put it in the pot and do not walk away because I've done that and lit off the smoke alarm in the house. So when you get, you start getting down, at first you think it'll never go, it'll never get down far enough. But man, when it gets close to the bottom, it goes like that. So you got to be standing there and pull the pot off the stove. I use a wide, um, it's a electric skillet. So it's wide, you know, the wider your surface, the faster it's gonna go, but you have to be standing there, especially when it gets close to the end and pull it off and get it, you know, then I would probably cool it down before you start mixing it with the salt, but you're getting it reduced quite a bit. Olives, olives are great. One of the best combinations I did was olive, rosemary, citrus, and garlic. And that was one of the best um, combinations I've ever made. Oh, it's delicious. It's great in spaghetti sauces. Um, it's just wonderful. Somebody's saying they got uh, diamond crystal at Eureka Natural Foods. So there you go. There's a great place to get it. Um, so those are some of the odd things. I thought to myself, it's funny because before I did this, I was like, somebody's going to say, well, what if you add carrots? I'm like, well, add carrots, see what happens. I mean, there's, it's, it'll probably add a bright color. It probably won't add too much flavor. You're basically putting like little pieces of dehydrated carrot in your salt. Um, I, I, I think that there are very few vegetables you couldn't add, but you're going to want to play with it a little bit. And it's so inexpensive that it's easy to play with it because you're going to, you know, it's not going to cost you much to try things and go, oh, that was okay. But then you could always like carrots. You could just throw it in some soup or some spaghetti sauce or something. You would probably wouldn't know the difference. So it's not like you're wasting it. So we're going to talk first about um, herbs, there's so many herbs that you can use. There's like the regulars, you know, there's all those herbs that everybody knows so well. There's basil, there's oregano. Um, Doreen is going to put some pictures up just so you can see. These are, you know, some, that's a photo from my mom's yard. That's an oregano plant growing in a hole in a uh, concrete block uh, raised bed. Um, there's marjoram, which is similar. Um, one of the oreganos that I have is called za'atar, and it's a really strong um, uh, oregano, but there's all kinds of different oreganos, and they all work really well. Thyme um, is a wonderful herb, but let me just tell you, if somebody gives you something made with thyme, they love you very much because, dang, it's so hard to get enough leaves off those little bitty stems. It's like something you want to sit in front of the TV set with a bowl and just be stripping the thyme off the leaves. It just takes forever. And it's such, it's a delicate, wonderful flavor, um, but it just takes a lot of time. And as it should, I guess. <laughs> so rosemary- no, no pun intended. No, 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 there really wasn't, but it does. And then rosemary, of course, everybody, I think in Humboldt County or in thereabouts, you know, and, and beyond where every, everybody is, has access to rosemary. If you don't have it in your own yard, your neighbor is probably growing a plant. And that's one that is super powerful, super strong tasting, really easy to come by. Any time of year, you can make something with rosemary. It's a pretty wonderful thing. Bay is an interesting plant. Um, it's, we have, it's uh, Loris nobilis, which is the culinary bay. And that's what this tree is. And you can grow them and you can grow them in pots really easy. I have had 
one in a pot for probably 20 years. You can grow them in a pot for a really long time. You just keep snipping the leaves. You know, if you have a desired shape in mind, just snip the leaves down. I had never thought of using this in an herb infused salt till Dottie Simmons did it. And I was like, who's ever heard of eating bay leaves? Because ultimately that's what you do. If you're gonna chop it up in your infused salt, then you're basically consuming the bay leaves. It works great. It's a, such a wonderful um, flavor, so aromatic. It's, it's, it's delicious in an herb infused salt, but that's one I think a lot of people wouldn't think of. And there of course is sage. I think that's a pretty common herb that people use. That's not a very fabulous specimen I have there, but I think I was just getting, you know, going through and kind of trimming things up at the end of the year. And, you know, a lot of those yellow leaves wouldn't end up in the herb infused salts. Um, lemon verbena, I think people are familiar with that one. That's a pretty plant and has a nice smell. Chives are great. And then the chive blossoms are wonderful. Like I said, you could use those blossoms and it would add a purple color to your herb infused salts. The thing is, it's not going to be purple herb infused salts because you're going to have probably not just her, um, chive flowers, although I suppose if you had enough chives, you could. Um, so it's just going to be little speckles of purple in there, and those are really pretty. Lemon balm, which is actually behind that chive plant, but we're going to see a picture of lemon balm here. Lemon balm's nice. It is a mint. Remember the mint family? It can be invasive. It's weird here in Humboldt County. It's never been invasive for me, but I planted it down in San Ramon in my mom's yard, and it is everywhere, and um, it's pretty easy to, to yank out if you don't like it or if it's growing somewhere you don't want it to grow and you could mulch it over or whatever. But it's a really nice one. Member of the mint family has a very nice um, kind of honey lemon flavor is how I would describe it. Um, cilantro, wonderful. That would be great in like a, a, a Mexican blend if you were trying to make a Mexican blend salt. Um, mint is very good. Um, tarragon, um, you know, if, if you were making like a fish blend, you might go with tarragon. Um, and uh, fennel, also known for using in a fish blend, uh, dill, winter savory, parsley, um, so many different uh, herbs. And, you know, the thing about herbs that is great, I don't know if you've grown herbs yourself, but herbs are super easy to grow. They're super pest resistant. I put, I put down relatively pest resistant. No, they're super pest resistant because they have all those great oils in them that the insects don't like. And, and deer don't like, I have a real deer problem here. Deer do not like um, my herbs at all. Um, most of my herbs are perennial. So that's great. I've got them all year long. I don't have to really mess with them. I just go out there. They come back in the spring or they've there all year. So um, they're they're really a great thing to have in your garden. If you're a gardener, you can um, really herbs. Uh, it's a wonderful thing. Where to gather your herbs. Like, let's say you don't have herbs or let's say you do have herbs and you're like my niece. So my niece says, oh, I'm growing this rosemary plant. And I looked out my window at my beautiful rosemary plant and the neighbor's walking their dog down the street and the dog pees on the rosemary plant. She's like, oh. Well, I don't really want to be using that in my food. So she ended up putting in another plant in her backyard where she doesn't have animals interacting with it. Now she could wash it, but she'd just grow another plant too. So it's important to know what's been happening on the plants. Um, and it's important to know, uh, like if you decide, oh, my neighbor's got a rosemary plant, I'll just go over there and pick some. Well, it's, it would be important for you to go over there, introduce yourself, say, hey, I'd like to pick some of your rosemary because you can find out, are they spraying any pesticides around? Um, if, and, and just to, you know, it's the neighborly thing to do. Say, hey, I'm gonna make this urban pea salt. I'll bring you a jar if you let me pick some of your rosemary or you could bring them a jar anyway. But anyway, so it's important to be aware of, you know, what's going on with the plants that you're putting in your food. Um, you're, uh, you're going to wash them anyway. You're gonna, I mean, that is important. It's important to wash them. It's important to look through them. I was washing some, herb, some herbs over here. Yeah, I had a slug in there. So I was like, yeah, I wanna make sure I get rid of the slug. Um, get rid of any like, you know, slug poop, because that's always where there are slugs or slug poop. So you, so you do want to wash them. And what I do is I just take a, a kitchen towel 
and I wrap them up in the kitchen towel. You could use a salad spinner to spin off the water, but I wrap them in, I just take mine and put them in a kitchen towel. I, I don't mind if they're a little bit wet, but ultimately you're gonna be drying the water back out of them. So having a whole lot of water in them in the first place doesn't really make a lot of sense because you're gonna be basically dehydrating them later. So um, if you're gonna be um, harvesting plants in the wild, obviously you need to know your plants. You need to make sure that the plants that you're harvesting are um, safe to eat and not poisonous. You know, not all plants are edible. So that's true in your garden as well as in, in, the, in nature in the wild. To harvest them, you're gonna need something like some kitchen shears or, you know, something like this, you know, a little pair of nippers. And when you're harvesting, you don't want to just whack your plant all the way to the ground. It's really stressful for them. I, I use my kind of rule of thumb is one fifth of the herb material on the plant, unless it's an annual and I'm just going to rip it all out and, you know, use it all up and that's it for the year. But if it's a perennial, I use only one fifth of the herb at a time. And then I snip from all over the plant. Don't just snip like, that's well, that's a fifth. You know, you wanna be able to snip all over the plant. So give the plant a chance to recover after you've cut um, the parts. So you wash them, you pat them dry, um, and then you strip the leaves from them. So, so here I've got a little, it's a, this is that Zaatar I was telling you about. It's a pretty um, potent, um, oregano that I got from the ladies at Flying Blue Dog and it's a wonderful plant. It actually does well on the coast. We weren't sure it was going to live here but it actually likes it here. So to strip the herbs you basically grab it at the top, you pull down and the herbs come off. You pretty much don't want stems in your herb infused salts because they will be like little pieces of wire in there when they dry um, and you will process them up or chop them up but still you don't want to start with something that's really wiry in your um, in your urban fuse salts. So we're going to wash them, we're going to dry them, we're going to strip the leaves. Um, and then let me just talk a little bit about citrus. Um, people do really well with citrus here on the coast. You can grow some citrus plants, but uh, citrus is also a seasonal sort of thing. So what I do is I use um, these preserved lemons. Now we did, a, we did a workshop on this just a couple months ago and we talked about how do you make these? It's just basically, it's basically citrus and salt and you can make all kinds of different ones. So you can go kumquats or you know any, anything really you can preserve. I find in cooking, I really like the lemons, but in, um, if you're gonna end up using them in the salts, then you could, you know, I've done kumquat, you know, it's, it's like whatever um, type of citrus you want to play with. But um, yeah, it's a, a great way to have citrus not in season. So here in May, I would be making my herb infused salts and I got my garlic because it's all ready and I've got my herbs because they're all looking beautiful but citrus is not in season. So I just go and get my jar of of uh, preserved lemons and away I go. Now, if I'm gonna use fresh lemons, cause actually I do almost have year round lemons because our weather is so mild there, is I would, I would zest them with a microplaner. And these are great tools, but I think a lot of people don't use them what I think is correctly. So you see that there's a trough there. So a lot of people do it like this. But the thing is, is the trough's there for a reason. So if you do it like this, all of that lemon stays in the trough. And then when you're ready to use it in something, you just dump it out. And um, there's this nice bit of lemon that I just grated from this lemon. So that's, that's how I use that. I just want to mention that because I think that's something that's pretty easy to, to do is to turn it over and have, um, have it be more difficult to use. So I think that's a great way to do lemons. Garlic, like I said, I wait till um, garlic's uh, in my garden, and that's one of my heads of garlic. And gar garlic is a great thing if you guys are also gardeners as well as cooks. Um, garlic is wonderful because you can use your garden in the winter. I plant in the end of November and I harvest in May. So the 
the more you have things planting it in your planted in your garden in the winter time, the less weeds you're going to have in there because Weeds love to have an empty spot to grow. So if you grow garlic in there, you're gonna have fewer weeds and you have this wonderful, um, wonderful garlic. Somebody is wondering, they wanna can the lemon? It's not canned, I'm sorry, I should have explained that. That's in a canning jar, but it's, a, um, it's just a screw top plastic lid. And when you make the preserved lemons, they take a long time. These uh, I made in January of 2020. So they're two years old. Oh, two and a half. So um, they keep for a really long time, but you just salt and lemons. Um, and I think we might have that uh, lemon demo up on our site that if you wanted to watch that video, you could make your own preserved lemons. Um, edible flowers, borage, so pretty. Isn't borage pretty? So just the flowers is what I would use from this plant um, and put them in and they would make really nice, um, nice pretty blue spots. Lavender, um, lavender is kind of an acquired taste. Uh, not everybody would like lavender in their food. Um, that is also true with rose. Roses are, you know, that's a particular flavor that you may not be expecting when you're eating your pizza or your spaghetti sauce or whatever it is you're eating. So you just want to be careful with those herb blends to make sure that you're putting foods together, flavors together that people are going to know how to use. Um, so that's, uh, that's one of the herbs that I use. Um, calendula flowers, very pretty. Those are nice. Um, and I use the petals off the flowers and that makes a really nice yellow, orangey yellow um, color. Sunflowers are great because, hey, when you grow sunflowers, they have those big beautiful heads and they have all those petals. And so I pick those petals and I add them in and it adds that kind of uh, sunset sort of color into my herb infused salts. Uh, there are other, other Flowers I might use would be bee balm, nasturtium flowers. I've used nasturtium quite a bit because when you have nasturtium plants, you have a lot of flowers and um, it's so easy to collect enough to add to make the, the color of the salt change. Um, so once you start like looking at what you got in your yard and what you have, you know, in your garden and um, your pantry and what sorts of blends you might want to make. What I do next is, um, you know, I kind of put them all in bowls so that I'm ready to go. I don't want to be like, oh, now I should go get some rosemary. No, I've got every ingredient already planned out ahead of time. So I'm ready to start assembling my urban fused salts. So this is what I do. I can be kind of systematic. So what I do is I make myself a list. These are the herbs I have handy right now. My writing is not fabulous, but when I did this, I had rosemary, garlic, preserved lemons, oregano, za'atar, sage, thyme, lemon verbena, macrot lime leaves, bay leaves, tarragon, sunflower petals, nasturtium petals, and calendula petals. Okay, those were all the different ingredients I went, I had. And then I said, what would go well with what? So what sorts of blends would I like to make? And sometimes you don't know what sort of blends are gonna work. You just go, hey, wouldn't it be fun to mix this with that? And you just go for it. So I did number one, preserved lemon, lemon verbena, garlic, sunflower petals, oregano, za'atar. That was blend number one. Number two was, you're gonna recognize, see some repetition here. Za'atar, garlic, preserved lemon, this one sounds almost exactly the same, but then I've added some nasturtium and uh, calendula petals. Then I did just some rosemary, thyme, tarragon, and garlic. Sometimes you have some things that are like, this is an old standby. Here's one right here. Rosemary, garlic, preserved lemon, oregano, and bay. That's great. Sage, rosemary, bay, garlic, sunflower petals. So what I do is I just do like this. I just, it's not really rocket science here. I just make lists of what my blends are. So that I know ahead of time what I'm going to put either in my food processor or in my um, on my chopping board if I'm going to do it that way. So assessing your ingredients, writing them down, and then um, I just want to talk briefly about tools. What sorts of tools do you need? Obviously, I showed you the shears for nipping the um, 
the herbs and getting those together. And I, I like to have the bowls to put them in separate bowls. Parchment paper is really important. Um, parchment paper is what I dry them on, whether I'm doing them in the oven or I'm doing in my food dehydrator. A pencil to write on the parchment paper, because I really think using markers with that indelible ink and putting food on it and then having it evaporate, I think is just, I don't have proof that it's not a good idea, but I really don't think it's a good idea. So I use a pencil to write on my parchment paper. And then you need, you know, a cutting board. You'll see I've got a cutting board here. Um, and then uh, a good, good knife. I like, I like a big knife. I'm a big person, so I like a big knife. Um, you want a knife that's comfortable, that's sharp, um, and that's, you know, that you're just really comfortable with. So that's important to have. Um, I use a food processor. So I have, there we go. Okay, so it's got a bowl with a chopping blade and that fits on my food processor and we'll spin things around. Honestly, I'm not hand chopping the herbs at home. But I wanted to show you how to do it because if you don't have a food processor, I want you to be successful doing this if you don't have the same tools that I have in my kitchen. A dehydrator with a tray, same thing. Not everybody has a dehydrator. Um, I was lucky enough this month to buy a Schmancy um, Excalibur dehydrator, which I love. I've used the heck out of it so far. I love it, um, but not everybody has that. So what I, I'll, I'll get to how to do this in a second, but you know, the other option is to do it in your oven and just take a rimmed cookie sheet and put a piece of parchment on it. So you don't need to have the special equipment to do this, especially since herbs are pretty, you know, they're pretty forgiving, you know, they're pretty easy to dry basically. And so you don't really need those things. So now we're gonna go over the how to of doing this. It's a very simple, um, but you know, you learn the things along the way that you think are simple, but only because you've done them a zillion times. So I'm gonna pop my food processor up here so you can watch this in action. So my first step is going to be blending the herbs. So I've got two cups of herbs here and I'm gonna blend them with two tablespoons of salt. The reason that you don't put all of your salt in at the same time is that it will turn your salt into powder. And if you try to use it on something, it'll be like dust. It won't have any texture to it. You will have broken up all of the texture by um, powdering it to death in your food processor. I'm not sure you could hand chop it to death, but definitely um, in the food processor, it just would turn it into dust. So this is two tablespoons of salt. And the salt acts as an, at this point, acts as an abrasive. So it's in there chewing against your herbs and helping to break them up. So yes, two cups of herbs to two tablespoons of salt. So that's what we're starting with. And we're gonna add some more salt later, but this is what we're gonna do. And I'm not sure how loud this is gonna be on your end, but here we go. So I wanna chop it up really fine. I want it to be like a paste. So I don't want to be able to recognize anything in there. I just wanna see a green, a green mass. You can pulse it. So I ran it pretty good here, but it still needs to run a little more. And I'm gonna to need to scrape the sides down. Just get that all in there. And I'll run it a little longer. Okay, I, I might normally chop it more than this, but I think everything was a little damp. But um, if, it, if you dry out the herbs good with the towel, it won't be quite as damp as this, but yeah, things are a little bit larger than what I would like, but I'm gonna go ahead and go with it. 
So you want to turn it really into a really fine, fine paste. Let me just give it a little. Other little world. All right, so now the next step is you're going to take three quarters of a cup of salt. And mix it with herbs. Don't you hate when you watch a cooking show and people don't get everything out of the bottom of the bowl and you're like, why don't you get the rest of that out of the bowl? And I'm so compulsive that I get it all out. So then you just take and you stir this together. I'm gonna to tilt this down so you can see a little better, hopefully. I know the lights are very good in here right now because the sun has come out. That's, but that's, that's gonna, good. Good. Okay. And you're just gonna stir it till it's completely combined. And it is the most beautiful green color. Oop. It's kind of messy. Well, it's messy for me. It might not be messy for you. So you mix it together. And then once it's completely mixed. This is something that I found out was key. And on the piece of parchment paper, you write down the names of the herbs that you have put in, onto this, that you're putting onto this piece of parchment paper. So whether you're doing it in the oven or you're doing it in the food dehydrator, you write on the piece of parchment what is going on there. And that's so you don't forget later, because trust me, you think you'll remember. And you won't. Well, if you're like me, you won't. So um, this is pretty well mixed together. And then I'm just going to spread it out. So spreading it out doesn't mean you have to be like super compulsive about it, but you just know that, you know, the more spread out it is, the faster it's going to dry. And the sooner you'll have herb infused salt that you can use in the kitchen. So it's all pretty well spread out on there. That's good enough. And I'm usually like to go in there and play with it when I'm, you know, while it's going, I go, oh, are you done yet? You know, and I get back in there and move it around one more, but you don't have to. So you just get that stuff all spread out like that. And then, and you write the names because you will forget what they are. And the cool thing you can do too, that I always do is when I'm done drying the herbs and I pour the herbs into a jar, I tear that pencil that I've written what the herbs are off and I shove it in the jar and I put the lid on because I'll forget later what was I just put in the jar. So it just helps you to remember, okay, this is parsley, sage, oregano. The little sheets in there, you turn on the, you screw on the lid. And that way you've got your big containers with your herb salts all labeled and you know what's in there. And later on, you can take them and make them into gifts, but you've got them all ready to go and you know what everything is. Um, you, then you've got to dry them. And if you have a food dehydrator, you want to set it at 105. You don't want to dry this at 180 or 200 or anything like that, because you're basically cooking the herbs at that point. What you want to do is slowly evaporate out the water and you want as much as of the flavor to stay there. Um, so I set my uh, dehydrator at 105, um, which works out really great. If you have a gas oven with a pilot light, you can put it in there. Um, gosh, my mom's gas oven gets to be about 140 degrees or something inside. So what I do is I open the door and shove a towel in so that it can vent out. And that's just the pilot light. That's not even turning the gas stove, the gas oven on. An electric oven works really well with uh, just the light. 
the light in an electric oven will work really well. It doesn't have a fan. It's not going to blow the, um, the air around like your dehydrator will, but it works perfectly fine. I know because I tried it last night because I was pretty confident it would work. And I did, um, I did um, make some tempeh. And so I had used a temperature probe in my oven to see what the temperature was reaching. And I knew that it got to about a hundred, over a hundred degrees in there if the door was shut. So I knew it was too hot with the door shut. So I propped it open. And also with the moisture that's in there, you want that moisture to be able to escape. One thing I have to say though, is I don't think I would go into business doing herb infused salts and use my oven because I think ultimately I suspect the salt and the moisture might have um, a, a problem with the metal that's in your oven. I think if you do a few batches, I don't think it's gonna hurt it, but I'm just saying if you were like, oh, I'm gonna make urban few salts and sell them to the public, I would get a dehydrator to do that. So I wouldn't use my oven for that. So what happens is if, uh, you know, well, here's the batch I did last night. Sometimes, depending on how much how much uh, vegetative material that you have in there, you might actually get it to, it might form like a leathery sheet. You may feel like you have to pulse it back in your food processor to get it more salt-like. This for me is fine. I like a little chunky salt. If you don't like it chunky, you can put it back in the food processor and process it a little bit, but be very, very careful that you don't go past um, the texture that you want right on the powder. Because once you're at powder, I mean, it's not like you can't still use it, but it's not going to have the texture that you're expecting in your salt. This is really nice. It is a beautiful color and it maintained this pretty color. It was pretty similar to this. Not, it's not quite as vivid in the final product, but it's pretty, pretty vivid, I think. Pretty nice color that I got there. So this is um, the dried in my oven with the oven light on. So something you can do. I like these little pieces, you can just crunch them up. So that's how it works in the oven in the, like I said, in the dehydrator 105. Um, like I said, if you want to break it up even further, like look at this one, that one's pretty chunky. I think I've got that one over here somewhere. You know, sometimes they're like this, they're like pretty chunky, depending on what you're gonna use it for. You might want chunky, but you might not want chunky. So it's up to you. And if you, like I said, careful with the processing. Um, you can, some, like I hand broke that up. I could hand break up this one. You're seeing the picture of there. I could just take it and just kind of rub the two pieces of paper together and it would break down into the point where I want to use it. If you're using it as a finishing salt, you may want it a little less crunchy. So you don't wanna be biting into one of these big old herby chunky nuggets um, when you're eating something. Maybe you do, so it's up to you with, with the food that you're eating, but I would find that I'd wanna break it down a little bit. Um, label everything, label your jars for storage. Um, this is not a pretty label. This is just me sticking a label on there so I don't forget. I found masking tape works really well. Um, you can stick it on, it's easy to come off. God, I hate putting a label on that you can't get off. So this one goes on easy. You can write on it with a felt pen and then it comes off very easy. This one's kumquat salt with rosemary. So pretty, isn't it? It's like orange, it came out so pretty and it tastes really good. You get these little nuggets of kumquat when you eat the food that you've used it on. You can buy these cute little jars. I, I would caution you though, to try and stay away from metal if you can, especially if you're gonna be storing it for a long time because metal and salt do not like each other and you can end up with things rusting. Um, you can make yourself little labels. I'm not really fancy with that and I'm not really like somebody to get the computer out and make pretty labels, but you could do that. And I've given people for gifts, big sets of urban few salts and it's really fun that they, um, that they like them and they use them. You can buy these things, although, you know, I'm not a huge fan of plastic, so they have a little zipper on them. You can actually run them through your, um, your sealing machine and seal them. So somebody would actually have to, it'd be like buying one, you'd have to cut through and then, or tear through and then and, undo them. Or usually if I use these, I just put it in there and I don't do that extra step. 
It's important to, to seal them though. It's important to put them in a jar because you don't want um, moisture to get to them. And you know, here on the coast, it wouldn't take long if I left these trays out of finished salt that they would start to absorb moisture from the air and they would become undehydrated or rehydrated, I guess is the word. So um, that's not, that's not something I want to do. So I want to make sure that I, I put them in something to seal them. There's that Ziploc container with some of that kumquat rosemary herb infused salt. What else? Oh, these are cool. So these are lids. I wish they were cooler because eventually the stupid lids will break, but they're, but they're kind of cool. So they, these are things you can buy. They're lids or little canning jars. So this is like a four ounce canning jar. And this is a lid that would fit on basically any canning jar that has a regular mouth size. So it's kind of nice. So it's got the flip top, you could shake out the salt. Um, yeah, if they didn't break eventually, they would be nicer than, than they are. Um, canning jars are great. To, I mean, any canning jar with a canning jar lid with a label on it would be fine too. Those are great. And then as with any food um, that you preserve, the best places to store food is um, cool, dark, dry. That's the best place to store anything. Whether you canned it or you know preserved it some other way, cool, dark, dry. That is going to keep things from discoloring. Like if you put this in the sun somewhere, eventually it bleached those colors out. Um, if you left it open and it wasn't dry, it would reabsorb moisture. Um, hot heat tends to destroy things too. So those are the things to remember about, um, the, about storing the herb salts, but also storing anything else. Now I have this other trip because, trick because I hate cleaning things. I hate doing dishes. I wish I had somebody to follow me around all day and just clean up after me. I would make so many more things. But if, I you, if you cook me dinner, I'll clean your dishes. That would be fantastic. <laughs> so this is what I do. So you got this bowl. It's got these herbs. It's got this salt. You're like, yeah, that's going to be something I'm going to have to clean. Well, what you do is you take a piece of bread and you make breadcrumbs because it's going to take up all of this great, or, I mean, this thing we were complaining about, it's got these herbs, it's got this salt, it's going to take up those flavors and um, be There we go. And uh, you can see it's, it's the crust is a little bit, but this is great. You know, anybody who uses breadcrumbs when they're cooking, they have some really nice herbaceous breadcrumbs would be great. You could toss that in the freezer and then you're ready to go. And it gets your uh, bowl pretty clean there. And, and it's just something that I do to use up whatever's in the bowl. And so, that's something that I do. And then, and then here's the thing, you know, you make these for gifts, you give them to people and people are like, oh, how nice, how cool. And they take them home. And every time you go to visit them, you see them on their shelves and you're like, oh, they're not using the herb infused salt I gave them. So I, what I suggest you do is to give a gift with the, uh, the, of the salt with a recipe for people to help them figure out how to use it. And if you see it on their shelf in their house, I think you need to point it out and say, you need to use that. But um, some of my favorite ways to use it, just so you have some ideas in your head about, uh, so somebody just asked, what do you use these for? Um, somebody was telling me once they used to work in a pizza place and they put uh, salt all the way around the edge of the pizza and it had this salty crust and it was delicious. And I would say at the pizza place, that was how they made the pizza. They would make it and they'd put that salt all the way around the edges, delicious. So that's a great way to do it. Um, that's actually a focaccia. And I have to say that you should go and make this. And this is from Bon Appetit's recipe. It's called Shockingly Easy Focaccia Recipe or something like that. But look up Shockingly Easy and it'll take you right there. 
And this is super, super easy to make. And um, it's, you know, really light, bubbly, airy focaccia, and then put the herb and pea salts around the edges. Um, I use it for seasoning anything. If you're seasoning a chicken, you're seasoning beef, pork, fish, whatever, you're, whatever meat you're seasoning, it works well with meat. Just make sure the flavors correspond. So you're not using something that's really flowery with something that you're going, yeah, that doesn't quite work. So you wanna make sure that the flavors correspond. If you would always use garlic and oregano and rosemary on potatoes, then use your garlic, oregano, rosemary, salt on your potatoes. Um, so anything that you normally cook now that you would use herbs in, go ahead and use the salts. Stews, bread dough, you know when you're adding that salt into your bread dough, use your herb infused salts. Now you're gonna to wanna to add a little bit more because there's a whole lot of herbs in there. And that's something I wanted to mention too. When you make this herb infused salt, do not skimp on the amount of herbs that you put in. This is a herb salt. It's not a salty herb, it's a herb salt. So you want heavy on the herbs, lighter on the salt. And so when you go to cook with it, just adjust accordingly. Now you're gonna ask me, what's the ratio? You're gonna to have to wing it. I just kind of wing it, but um, but you just know that you're gonna to wanna to add a little more salt than you normally would because there's the herbs taking up some of that space. Spaghetti sauce is great. It's a great addition to spaghetti sauce. I use that olive one in there. Um, it's so delicious. Um, you could add the bay in there because you know it's traditionally you would add bay leaves to spaghetti sauce and that would import part that bay flavor. Um, beans, you know, we do the ham hock with beans and it's great to use the herb salts for that. Um, vegetables um, are really good. There's some, I use that kumquat uh, salt with my asparagus and it's delicious. You get these little flakes of kumquat on there and you're just eating the asparagus going, what is that? That's so good. Um, it just kind of pumps up the flavor of everything that you use it in. And, um, popcorn, people use it in popcorn. You know, you're making your popcorn, you're making butter to your popcorn and a little herb and salt and you're getting that like little bite of rosemary and oregano and whatever with your herb and salt in your popcorn. Eggs, it works really well with eggs. Um, it works well as a finishing salt as long as you're getting the texture down to something that you would wanna have in your mouth. And so it's not like this big old crunchy, salty, what is that? So you wanna make sure the texture is right there. But anything that you would normally add salt to, you could add urban fused salts. Now, the question is, what about sweet things? What about your baking and you're making a cake? Well, I would say as long as the flavors were compatible, um, you might you, you leave that garlic out this time. So you might use lemon and you might use um, uh, some lavender, so a lavender lemon salt, la uh, rose lemon salt. You might use something like that. I don't know how much it's going to flavor your finished product, but if you made some salts like that, you could um, use those in sweet things like cakes or um, pastries or something like that. Um, ingredients to avoid. That's really important. I have made mistakes. Oh, here's one. So I wanted to show you this one. I did a mushroom. I did a mushroom salt. I'm using some mm, really nice local mushrooms. This one's gonna take a reprocessing. This one's like mush mushroom cracker salt. It really um, had so much vegetative material in it that it just made a paste that when it dried, it became like a cracker. No problem, I'll stick it in the food processor. I'll pulse it and try to get it down to a texture that'll be easier to use. But I think it'll be nice because Sometimes you want that like that umami from the shiitake mushrooms. And this is from a local, this is from my, my Calady, who's a local mushroom producer. So um, salts are great. That another, where's my other mistake? Oh, I think it might be still in the fridge. It's in the fridge because it's a mistake. So what it is, is and it's fantastic. It's one of the best herb salts I've ever made. But um, I thought to myself, what if I took some of my pesto from the freezer and I made herb infused salt just out of the pesto? It's so good because pesto has Parmesan cheese and lemon and basil and garlic. I mean, it's like all these fantastic flavors. But what it also has in it 
is olive oil. And olive oil does not, I don't, I think that um, it would probably go rancid if I left it out at room temperature. Um, I, would, I would keep anything that you use uh, oil on. So it's beautiful and it tastes fantastic, but I would store it in the fridge, which makes it a little bit more tricky at, for giving get it as a gift because you would put that instruction with it that they would need to give it as a gift. And I want to point out that my thing is right in the jar. So I know what salt is it. So uh, anything with oil, I think is a little bit of a mistake, but maybe not really. It just depends on whether you're willing to actually store stuff in your fridge. Mine's pretty full to overflowing, so it's, it's a little problematic for me, but um, it's, it's something that could be, I mean, that's really delicious, so maybe it's not a mistake. Um, weird flavors and textures, yeah, it's gonna happen. You're gonna mix stuff together and you're gonna go, yeah, that wasn't such a good idea. But you know, it happens. There's my shiitake mushrooms. It didn't look that bad when I put it in the dehydrator. It's when I pulled it out and it was all crunchy. Um, yeah, rose, I think, is another one that is, be careful with it, because I think that, fla that flavor might be so odd that it might, uh, it might make it not so delicious in the end. And now I'm going to show you one thing that I think is my favorite way to use Urban fused salts. And it's funny too, because I was gonna make the focaccia and show you how to make the focaccia, but it's so easy to make. You don't really, you don't really need that. You need this recipe. Because I have made this and I brought it to parties and I've had people eat so much of it that they didn't want to have dinner. So, and it's so simple. Oh. What it is, you take a piece of French bread or whatever, you know what I'm talking about, just a good old piece of bread. And I do normally um, make my own sourdough with the no need recipe and it's so good and so easy. And I use that, that's like the best because it's got good, you want something that's like a bread that's got some structure to it. You don't want like potato bread or something like that. And you just take and you spread uh, olive oil on it. That's it. It's th this easy. I mean, seriously, I've made big old batches of this and people are like, this is so good. It's just bread and salt. Yeah, it is just bread and salt. So let's see which one. Oh, I'll use this new one. This is new. Put this one on there. So I take it and I just I crumble it because you don't like want a big old chunk of salt. And I'm gonna put it under the broiler. I have a high salt tolerance, let me just tell you. So I might put on more salt than you would. But I just put it under the broiler and broil it till it's toasting. And then usually I make like, I'll make a little feta cheese, some sort of spread or hummus or something like that if people wanna add a little something else on top of it. But um, just for a few minutes, and oh, I wanted to say this. You might say, why don't I just do it in the toaster? Well, toaster toasts both, toast both sides at once and it's not the same thing. So what I'm doing is it's another step, it's another dirty dish that I'm gonna to have to clean, but it's gonna be crunchy on the top, soft on the bottom. And seriously, it will change your world. This, that and the salt will change your world. You'll have an appetizer that costs, you know, almost nothing and is so great that people love it. So that's it, I think for, I mean, I'm sure people have questions about things. Oh, how long does it take to uh, do it in the dehydrator? It took over 24 hours. I mean, it didn't, I don't think it took 24 hours. I think it like 10, 10 hours it probably took to dry. Um, it's something that you could kind of figure out as you go and, you know, do a batch. It also depends how full is your dehydrator, you know, the more stuff you have in there, the longer it takes. But I just, I put a whole bunch of different combinations in there at the same time. I give everybody its own um, sheet in there. And so I can dry, mm, I think that's eight, uh, eight or nine trays at the same time. So um, you can get a lot of, a lot of stuff dried and then you end up with 
Oh, you're probably wondering how much does that make? Hmm. I'm gonna say it makes probably like a cup and a half of uh, urban fuse salt from that recipe, maybe a little less. So are there any questions? Yes, I will get to them. So okay. the kumquat salt, do you, you, can you share a little bit more, but there were a few questions about the sure. kumquat salt. I, I made uh, preserved kumquats by taking kumquats. I'll show you, this is so easy. Okay, imagine this is a kumquat. Where's my knife? There we go. And just cut it like that. I don't cut it all the way through. Okay, a kumquat, I don't cut this many times because kumquat's really little. And then I'm gonna put some of my salt into a bowl. You see smoke coming out behind me. Let me know, because that's that piece of toast I have in there. So you take your lemon or kumquat, put the salt in there like this. Okay, so you got salt in there, all the nooks and crannies, you cram it into a jar, you push it down with something. So you're trying to expel as much liquid as you can. You put as many in the jar as you can. You want to make sure that it's got a goodly amount of lemon juice on top or kumquat juice. And, or you could put lemon juice on top of kumquat, that probably wouldn't matter that much. And then I put a little weight on top and um, close the lid, which I use plastic because the metal will rust. And then I let it go for six months to a year because I think the longer it takes better and it makes the most fantastic tasting brightest. You think it's like, ooh, that's like a year old lemon. No, it's like the brightest, most fantastic lemon you've ever had. It's like it was just picked yesterday and you're just eating the sunshine and it's wonderful. So you just do that, make sure it's covered with lemon juice and um, over time, just check it, make sure it doesn't need to be topped off with more lemon juice and let it go. Oh, okay, so the kumquats, I did that. And then I cooked a recipe with them and I was like, ooh, kumquat, it's kind of weird in food. I'm not sure I like it. And, I, and it's funny because I like it in the preserved salts, but it was like too much because I have dishes that I make that I use just preserved lemons. And so it was like way, orangey tasting kumquati. It was just kind of odd. So I kept it though. And I kept thinking about what am I going to use it in? And I made the salts with it and it's fantastic in the salt, but it's just, I think it's just because it's like tinier pieces and it's just scattered over a broader area. It's not quite as intense, but it's really, really good in the salt, not as a preserved lemon, preserved citrus. I didn't like it cooking with it. Okay. Oops. Um, oh, there's the smoke. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, there was. But I think we caught it in time, sort of. If you don't mind a little charcoal to coat her. But if the smoke alarm goes off, wouldn't that be bad? You guys would be deafened, trust me. It's so this is darker than I would normally do. It definitely has smoke coming off of it but it is so unbelievably good. And if you had some sort of like spread with some of the um, great local um, goat cheese and garlic and sun-dried tomatoes or something like that, it, it would just be even more fantastic, but it's gonna be pretty darn good. And you're gonna wish you had some. Mm. <laughs> you're just, yeah, go ahead. Uh -huh. okay. Don't eat it all in front of you. But. <laughs> When you use preserved citrus and infused salt, do you add a chunk in food processor with yours? That's a great point. So I meant to show you that when I got the jar out. So my, um, I lean on the side of taking the actual, okay, so here's a, here's a preserved lemon, just like what I did here. There it is. So I tend to like to, take the, um, the flesh away and use only the peel. I have used the whole preserved lemon before. Be careful not to use the seeds, but there you go. That's what I use right there. And look at that, that's two years in the jar. Look at that, that's just beautiful. Mm, I love salt. 
So yeah, it's good. Any other questions? Oh yeah. Oh yeah? <laughs> oh yeah. Might be more I've left out. <laughs> I, I think I might ask uh, Kay Cook to unmute because I'm not quite sure about the question. It's, it reads, do you place French bread on top of the oil, salt spread and broiler? Oh, uh, you take the bread and you just spread olive oil on it, sprinkle the salt on it and broil it. So you're leaving the salt oil side up when you broil it. I think she's wondering about, do I flip it yeah, over? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, ah, dehydration. When you de <laughs> I haven't had dinner yet. So <laughs> when you dehydrate, <laughs> when you dehydrate different uh, uh, different herbs at the same time, uh, uh, do they don't they infuse each other? Okay, they there don't we. seem to. I've done it. I thought about that too, and I've also thought about. Um, they're all pretty much the same texture, so they all dehydrate at the same rate, which is good because if you try and dehydrate different foods in a dehydrator all at the same time, you can have a problem where it slows down the dehydration of other things. Some things will slow down the dehydration of other things in the dehydrator and I'll make it like all the same kind of humidity and some things can take longer than they should and some will take less time than they should. So. I have not found a problem with doing different herb infused salts at the same time. They all taste distinctly what they are. I wouldn't do, like if you're trying to go that sweet route, I probably wouldn't put garlic in there anywhere in that dehydrator. I would try and stick with all sweet combination salts. Like, like I said, lavender and lemon and rose or you know something like that. I would try and keep those all separate. And honestly, I'm, I'm probably, I have never made one for using in sweet foods, um, but you could. I just want to let you know you could. Do you um, remember on the handout if there is a recipe for the olive salt? There isn't. There's really, you know, these are not, I would have to say that, that the handout has rule of thumb. So it doesn't have specific recipes like two tablespoons of rosemary. Although like I, like I mentioned, like rosemary is so strong. You, I wouldn't use that in thyme because I'd be like that time took forever for me to peel those stupid little stems off of. I'm not mixing it with rosemary because everything's going to taste like rosemary. I wouldn't overpower it with rosemary. So um, yeah, that about that. Um, and you can always, your olive salt is all of oh, you. Olive. All of you. Huh? <laughs> So what I did was I have a friend who has olives. And so my friend had cured olives and they had come out too salty. And I went, oh, hey, <laughs> let me see if I can make an herb infused salt with the olives. And it is just fantastic, but it's mostly olives, a little bit of rosemary and um, some garlic, probably let's say you're using two cups of olives. I've used probably, um, three or four, I, I like garlic, you know, again, it's like all personal preference, but I like garlic. So I would use a couple of cloves of garlic, probably a head of garlic. People accuse me of treating garlic like a vegetable and I'm guilty. And then, you know, just some, maybe a couple sprigs of rosemary leaves stri stri uh, stripped off of them. What else did I say? Oh, I've used uh, citrus in that. I've used either um, the preserved lemons or a preserved kumquat, or I've used um, orange is really fantastic in it. So grated orange zest is good in there. So here's a question about drying. So in the valley, when it's 100 plus outside, can you set your salt outside to dry? And of course it would be covered. I wouldn't, no, we don't have 100 degrees here, but I would think airflow, you know, like if you're dehydrating something else, you want a little airflow over it. So if you've got some good airflow, might put a little, cheesecloth over top of it, keep insects from landing on it, like you would with if you're dehydrating fruit or something in a area like that. Yeah, 100 degrees, that would be perfect. I, in the shade, I wouldn't put it in the full direct sun, but I'd put it in the shade. And I think it would dehydrate fine. I've never had the opportunity to try because it doesn't get more than like 60 degrees here, it seems like on the coast. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. And, and what's, how do you tell when the salts are dry enough? That's a good question. You, you they will feel, you'll reach in there. And when you go to break it up, like if there's chunks and stuff, it will feel wet. It will feel different. It will feel, it won't feel like when you first grab it, it'll feel dry. And then when you start to break it up, it'll be kind of clumpy and the clumps will kind of stick together. And once it's dry all the way, they'll just kind of like the salt will rain out and you'll know that it's dry. I think you'll know. Great. Um, if you don't have, if one doesn't have a um, food processor and you're hand chopping the herbs. I did mean to show you this. <laughs> I just, yeah. So yeah. is that if, if um, so when hand chopping, the herbs will probably not get as finely chopped, right, into the paste. So is that still going to work if the herbs are not like You can paste? get them pretty finely chopped if you keep chopping them. So, um, yeah, I meant to show you guys that. So it's pretty much, you do the same thing. So you get those two cups of herbs there, which you just and pretend this is two cups of herbs. And then you start with that little bit of salt and that acts as the abrasive. And then you just start chopping. Realize, of course, I would never be chopping like this because this thing is up to neck level because so that you can see it on the screen here, but I would have a lot better um, body mechanics safety going on here if I wasn't doing this on my iPad and trying to show you. But you just keep chopping and that's the thing is it can get really zen and um, it can be really nice to do this, especially if you got a good, like this knife is really sharp. And so you're not mashing it, you're chopping it and you're just going along and you just keep chopping till it all gets really, really fine. And if you run out of energy to do it anymore, then you've got something that's a really rough chop herb infused salt and that's okay too. You know, it's just not gonna be the same thing. It's not gonna be, it's not gonna come out of that shaker if it's really big pieces like this. So it just, you know, depend, it's gonna be dried herbs and salt if you don't keep going with it and chopping and chopping and chopping because you're releasing moisture and that spine and the salt is, is scratching the herbs and breaking them down. And, and the more you do that, the finer pieces you get um, and the more flavor gets released. And yeah, I can't leave it alone now, but you just keep going, just keep chop, chop, chopping. And then once you get all your three, you know, all your two cups of herbs chopped up super, super fine, then you hand mix in the three quarters cup uh, salt and then you, um, you dehydrate it. So it's pretty much just a matter of chop, 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 chopping, a lot of chopping. So um, let's see, a few more questions. Uh, what, I, maybe you answered this, so I apologize. What do you do to prepare olives for infusing with salt? Um, the olives that I used were uh, salt cured olives. So they were pretty dry and they were a little oily. So um, I have not had a problem of them going rancid or the, oil, the salt going rancid. Um, it didn't feel like they were near as oily as using the pesto in the salts. So it stayed uh, pretty dry and um, because they were salt cured olives. I don't know if you used uh, like big juicy Sevillanos or something like that, that were um, brine cured. Um, I don't know what they would come out like. I've never tried it. I've only used the salt cured shriveled gnarly olives. And then I pitted them, obviously. You don't want pits in your food processor because that would be a disaster. And um, just pitted salt cured shriveled dried olives is what I used. Okay, back to lemons. I had to move because I thought maybe I froze. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was cutting and pasting. So. <laughs> um, let's see, the, one of the questions I'll ask first is about lemon zest. Instead of preserved lemon or kumquat, can you use zest? Yes. Yes, that's what I was showing you with this thing. 
So this is the this is a thing. This is a microplane, and this is great for getting the lemon zest. And like I said, keep it cupped side up, and then you capture all of that zest, and then you can dump it all at once, as opposed to trying to zest it and keep it all in a you know contained area. You just it all loads up right in that trough there. And then you can just take your finger and just swipe down and get all that great lemon zest, you know, and put it in your, in with your, oh, I could do like great. this, making a new blend right here. And, right now. <laughs> <laughs> and can you remind us how much lemon uh, and salt uh, to do the preserved lemons? People are, uh, we can send them to the, the website, Everybody but. Do preserved lemons. There's, there, there is a recipe on there. Um, Honestly, I use as much as it takes. So um, bigger lemons are gonna take more, more salt than little lemons and some lemons are juicier than other lemons. So it's all, uh, I, what I do is I pour salt in the bowl, cut the lemons so that they stay together. If they fall apart, no big deal. But if they stay together, it's easier just to pull a whole lemon out of the jar. And then I just take and I sprinkle until the sides are coated. The insides are coated there, like that. Do, 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 do. There, done, into the jar. This is a fun thing to do with kids. In fact, urban few salts, fun thing to do with kids. But the lemons, so much fun, because you know their little teeny hands will fit inside of a wide mouth jar. My big hand is not going in that opening. So um, this is a fun thing to do with kids, making um, preserved lemons. So no, I don't have any measurements for you. I guess that's the bottom line. You're wondering what the ratio is? Nah, lemons and salt. <laughs> now on the mechanics, does elevation affect the temperature to dehydrate the food product or the length of time? That's a good question. That's a physics question. I don't think it's significant. But I don't know. Do you know, Darina? I don't think the pre it's a it's a pressure issue. So I don't think and yeah. a, and a and well, it is drier, higher temperatures. Well, yeah, maybe it I, is. I mean, I think it depends on your relative humidity, what your yeah. humidity location is. Yeah. I heard once like people in Sacramento until the humidity is zero percent, they won't dehydrate things. We would never dehydrate, dehydrate things on the coast. We have 100% humidity almost all the time. So, you know, it's really gonna dehydrate different on the coast as opposed to inland just because of the humidity. Elevation, I'm really, I really don't know the answer to that. Yeah, I don't, I don't think what, it, a, what about freeze dryers? Would this work with freeze dryers? Ooh, would it be fun to try? Um, I don't know that it wouldn't be just a waste of a freeze of a freeze dryer because you know they require so much energy to freeze dry things. I don't know that the stuff in them would change enough that it would be worth doing it. You know, like when you'd freeze dry ice cream, you know, then you've got this big old puffy thing that's crunchy now and soft and kind of crunchy. I think that all the constituent pieces of the urban few salt, you know, the salt's not gonna change texture. The herbs might get a little bit different uh, texture, but I don't think it would be as worthwhile as doing other things with the freeze dryer. I'd love to have a freeze dryer. All right. I'd love to do that. Uh, lots of accolades. People really enjoy this presentation. Yeah. Make it, make it. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the paper, so more mechanics. Do you leave the mixture on the paper while in the dehydrator? Yes. Yes, because like if you um, tried to put salt on there, it would go through the holes. So I want you to see how big the holes are on these racks. They're so big that the salt would go through the holes. Um, you leave the paper on the cookie sheet too. And it also helps you to keep track of what's in which tray and because you've written on it too. But I would definitely leave it on the, um, and reuse them. You can reuse parchment paper until it's like brittle and crunchy. You can reuse it over and over again. People oh. are getting hungry. Yeah, uh, I've been like, I'm gonna do this again, not burn it this time, I think. It's so good. Mm. <laughs> 
Uh, for those of you asking about the handouts, I will be, if you signed on um, after, I don't know, sometime this morning, I think I sent an email out. I will be um, sending another email for those of you who signed on late or sometime later today. Um, let's see. I think the rest are just yahoos and lots of awkward oh, Thanks. Yes. Guys, I hope you all make this. It's so easy and it's so cool. And they make such great gifts. Yep, lots of thank thinkies. You. Okay. Thank you all for joining us. And um, we will see you next month for... It's Ashley. Another Hi. presentation. Yeah. Thank something. you again. Yes. <laughs> I will let you know. Great.